Episode 3 of Ruby Volume 7 serves to showcase the abilities of the ace operatives of the Atlas military, each of them having opportunities to fight individually, showcasing their own talents and semblances, as well as coming together at the end to fight the Geist Grim, showing how well they work together as a cohesive unit. Now, since their introduction into the Ruby series, it's been theorized that the Ace operatives are based on the Aesop's Fables. Essentially, the Aesop's Fables are just a collection of short stories attributed to the author Aesop, and each of the fables seems to have a small lesson within them, at least for the majority of them. And each of the members of the Ace operatives seem to be associated with one of the stories of the Aesop's Fables to varying degrees. Some of them incorporate more of the story elements into their abilities and weapon choices, etc., and some of them seem to be more in name only, but I'll get to that in a bit. Let's go over which fable each of the Aesops is based on, starting with the leader of the Ace operatives, Clover. Now, Clover fights with a fishing rod and has a semblance very much based around good luck. Not to mention, he also has a four-leaf clover pin and the guy wears a lucky rabbit's foot on his waist. He's very much associated with good luck and he seems to be a fisherman. It seems very fitting that the fable he's associated with is a fisherman's good luck that follows a fisherman who's been out fishing all day with absolutely no luck. But at the end of the day, just as he's going to pack up his gear, a giant fish leaps into his boat and his patience is rewarded. And that's the overall lesson that is associated with that story. Patience will be rewarded. Now, as of yet, there's no tie-in really with that to Clover's character, but we'll see how it progresses throughout Volume 7. As all of the Ace operatives have really just been introduced to us, we'll have to see how their overall fable plays into how their character works out overall. Now, Clover is very much associated with his story, as is the next person, Harriet. Now, Harriet, her semblance is uh, super speed, which very much fits into the fable that she's based off of, the tortoise and the hare. Now, this connection between Harriet and the tortoise and the hare isn't as defined as it is with Clover as, well... Harriet isn't really acting the same as the hare in the tortoise and the hare. She's not arrogant as the hare was, because the story that, you know, all of us have heard probably at one point throughout our lives follows a hare being very arrogant towards the tortoise, saying that it's so slow it won't get anywhere, and eventually ends up with the tortoise and the hare being in a race. Of course, the hare is much quicker and takes off way out of sight, but in its arrogance, decides to take a nap before reaching the finish line to mock the tortoise even further. But in its arrogance, it falls asleep for much longer than anticipated, and by the time it wakes up, the tortoise is about to reach the finish line, and the hare is unable to catch up. The lesson being that the slow and steady wins the race. Or rather, that the race is not always won by the quickest person, or quickest member participating in the race in this case. So Harriet, her weapon of choice being the, you know, bionic arms, uh, doesn't really um, fit in with this fable at all. Unlike Clover's, where both his weapon and semblance come from the fable, I don't really see the connection from her weapon, but her super speed semblance definitely fits. And her personality isn't really drawn from the character either, but we'll see how it goes. She did seem a little bit arrogant towards Ruby that she was faster than her in her reaction time until, of course, she saw what Ruby's semblance actually was and then said, um, you know, your semblance might not actually be speed. Seems like she might be helping out Ruby, so not really much of the arrogant type. But I will point out that um, if Harriet has a connection to the hare, I wonder how she feels about uh, Clover having that lucky rabbit's foot that he's carrying around. I, I, I would love to see just a little scene where she has some sort of little problem with that or something. That would just be a lovely little tie-in, but I kind of doubt we'll see that. Now, I think one of the best representations of the Aesop's fable that a character represents is that of Mero. Now, Mero... A lot of people thought that he was based on the boy who cried wolf, which is actually not the case. There are many fables in Aesop's fables that refer to dogs as being one of the main characters, shall we say. The one that he's actually referencing is the dog and the shadow. 
This fable follows a dog that had just received a bone from a butcher and was very happy in that and was walking along on his way home and saw his own reflection in a lake that he was walking past. And in the reflection, he saw that the dog that he was looking at had a bone that appeared bigger than the one he already had. So without really thinking much in his greed, he decided to go snap at the bone that the dog had. Of course, it being just a reflection, he completely whiffed, and in doing so, he had dropped his own bone that he could only watch float down the stream. In his own greed, he lost all that he already had. And that's, you know, the lesson that's associated with that. Now, Mero doesn't really seem to be that selfish of a person, but, you know, everything else about him seems very much based off of this fable. He is a dog faunus, not to mention his name Mero, you know, Bone Mero. The fable is based on a dog having a bone. His name comes from that very much so, as well as his weapon is actually called Fetch. So, again, the dog associations, but then it comes to his semblance, which I think is absolutely brilliant. Now, we don't know the exact capabilities of his semblance or the extent that he can take it to, but what we saw in episode 3, the one instance, is he's able to snap his fingers and issue a command, in this case, stay, Again, you know, a command you'd issue to a dog, you know, sit, stay, heal, etc. More dog references in there. And he's able to make the dual centipede or sentinel grim stop in its place. But if you notice, Marrow also stops in his place as well. He doesn't move. Or in fact, I don't think he can move if he is immobilizing something else. Because Harriet had to move in and take out the grim. This ties in to the reflection aspect of the fable. The dog and the shadow being that the dog sees his reflection and because Mero is immobilizing something else, he cannot move as well. I love that tie-in and it's just, I, I, I think that's absolutely brilliant. Mero's already one of my favorite characters from the Ace Operatives and this just amplifies it even more. One thing I am interested in though is that Mero's semblance seems to have the most room to grow out of all of the other ace operatives. We've seen that their semblances are fairly straightforward in what they are, but Mero's, even though he can issue a command, is stay the only command that he has. For example, as I already stated, another popular command that is issued to a dog is sit. You know, if anyone else has uh, watched Inuyasha in the past, that command is used quite a bit throughout that series. And um, so when Kagome issues that command, sit to Inuyasha, he just essentially smacks into the ground. He's drawn down by gravity. Now I wonder if Mero has that capability, it's just he doesn't choose to use it because he would be dragged down by the gravity too. So I'd be, I'd, I'd be really interested to see if his semblance could be expanded upon in that way. If it's only the stay command, I'm completely fine with that, but I would love to see more tied in with that. Now, though the first three characters we've talked about uh, have pretty good tie-ins with their initial fables, um, the last two, Elm and Vine, are, I want to say, a bit more, you know, just cut and dry, as there's a fable called The Elm and the Vine that it seems like a lot of people are thinking that they are associated with that fable. In my digging around and everything, it seems as though there's a little bit of controversy that maybe the Elm and the Vine isn't associated with Aesop. A website that I visited that cataloged a lot of the Aesop's fables actually didn't list the Elm and the Vine as one of Aesop's fables, so I'm kind of confused as to if this is actually one of the fables, it's it mentions Aesop within the fable, so I would assume it was, or maybe written by someone else who was more of a follower of Aesop. I'm not exactly sure, but the overall fable in this case would be that both of the characters are referring to the same fable, it follows an elm and a vine, essentially it's kind of almost a courtship. It follows that the elm is kind of enticing a vine to kind of anchor itself around the elm, etc. It's kind of a poem of marriage, almost, which doesn't seem to be the case with the characters Elm and Vine in the Ruby series. And with their overall semblances, 
Vines is, Vines semblance is simply vines. I would prefer it actually be called aura vines, but that's what it is. He can extend vines from his arms that can wrap around things, as we saw with the Geist Grim, and anchor him to the wall when he was sliding down, etc. It's a very useful semblance, but it's literally just, okay, his name's Vine, his semblance is Vine, yeah, pretty cut and dry. Same with Elm, that her semblance is simply Roots. Again, I would prefer it be called Aura Roots, since both of them are actually amplifying their aura, manifesting it into a more physical form to anchor themselves and to manipulate it in different ways, but that's what her semblance is, which refers to her being Elm, a tree, etc. So it's not really associated with anything too deep of a meaning, and again, with the Elm and the Vine, there wasn't that much of, um, I would guess, a deeper meaning to it. It was just kind of a poem, and I don't know. Let me know what you guys think if you guys done, have done some more digging or know more about it. I would be really interested to hear what you guys think. I would like to believe, though, that maybe Elm and Vine are actually based on different fables, that each of them have their own individual one. I know Elm and Vine are kind of a pair, and they work together very well, but it doesn't seem like there's anything romantic with them, so I would like to believe that they're based on different fables. Now there is a couple other ones that are based on vines. One in particular that I liked was called The Goat and the Vine, which essentially follows a goat that used vines to hide from hunters, and after the hunters had passed, the goat, you know, just getting a little snackish, decided to eat the vines. So the vines decided to make some rustling sounds and lure the hunters back. And bye-bye goat. Essentially, the lesson in this one is you don't mistreat those who help you, as if you do, they will, you know, turn against you, as it happened with the goat. And this kind of plays into Vine's character, I think, that he doesn't mistreat anyone who he considers an ally. Even when Mero was kind of being ridiculed by a couple other members of his team, being called kind of a dimwit for his mind being one of his weaknesses, which again plays into Mero's association with the fable of the dog and the shadow, as the dog kind of acted without thinking, and that seems as though what Mero does sometimes. But Vine is, for lack of a better word, very passive towards everyone. Neither positive nor negative, but just very passive towards everyone, and I think that fits well with that story, though Again, it doesn't really seem that likely that it's associated with that. But again, let me know what you guys think. Then there's also another fable that... There's not really any fables that are associated with elms in particular, unless you consider, you know, the elm and the vine. But there is one that's associated with a tree that I find might be... might end up fitting in with elms' character at some point. It's called The Travelers and the Plain Tree. Essentially, it follows a group of travelers as they are resting under a large tree in the shade, and yet they are complaining about the tree, that it doesn't bear any fruit, that it's not very, not a very pretty looking tree, etc. And the tree lashes out at them saying, wow, you're essentially lying in the shade of my branches and everything, and you still criticize. Essentially, the lesson being learned is that your greatest blessings are of, are sometimes the ones you don't appreciate. That type of thing. Nothing really to associate that with Elm's character just as of yet, but I think it has the potential to play into her character depending on how it goes throughout the volume. But we'll have to wait and see how everything plays in. You know, Elm's name being Elm does really point to it, her being associated with the Elm and the Vine, but just the fact that the overall story is all about the kind of a romance between the Elm and the Vine just doesn't really seem to fit with me to those characters, and it doesn't... I don't know, it just doesn't seem to fit. And also those two being the only two that are based off of the same fable, I don't know. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments below. Do the associations with the Aesop's fables make sense? Do you guys have any other ideas as for what fables each of the Ace operatives could be based on? I really, I'm, I would really be interested in hearing what you guys think. Do you think my ideas for Elm and Vine seem to make sense that they could each be based on their own individual fable? I don't know. I'll leave a link down in the description below to the website that I found that has a giant list of all of the Aesop's fables, and you guys can go there and check it out if if you guys 
so desire. I mean, it's probably not something that many would be interested in, but if you decide to take a look, I'll leave it there if you guys are. So let me know what you guys think down in the comments below. I really look forward to hearing it. Thanks so much for watching. Make sure to subscribe if you have not already, as there will be many more videos coming out throughout the course of Volume 7. So I will see you guys in the next one.